Hello, welcome to the next in our series of webcasts on demystifying IFRS 9. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our global IFRS technical accounting function for financial instruments and I'm very pleased to be here today with John McDonnell. John is a partner in our Irish banking practice and he was also our member on the ISB's impairment transition group. Today we're going to be talking about forward-looking information. As we said on previous webcasts, IFRS 9 is an expected loss forward-looking information. And this is one of the biggest changes from IS 39. John, can you tell us a bit more about what the standard requires? Standard requires entities to include all available information in the calculation of expected credit loss, and that's past information, present information, and forward-looking macroeconomic scenarios. And you consider forward-looking information under IFRS 9 in two particular scenarios, if you like, the, the measurement of expected credit loss and considering whether there's been a significant increase in credit risk. So the standard requires you to include all information which is reasonable and supportable that's available without on-due cost or effort. Now the exemption of on-due cost or effort really doesn't apply to financial institutions, so you must always search for forward-looking information which may impact expected credit losses. So what does reasonable and supportable mean? Well, reasonable and supportable means you must include information about economic scenarios that might have an impact on your expected credit loss, and that may include one-off events such as Brexit. So you can't exclude forward-looking information which may impact on your probability default just because the event may be, have a low probability of occurring and may be remote. You must take it into account. So it's all about balance. It's about balancing the risk of excluding information which will be relevant to the calculation of expected credit losses with including spurious or speculative information which is little or no basis. Clearly you shouldn't include information which is little or no basis to the calculation of expected credit loss. So if a financial institution believes that certain economic information should not be included because it is highly speculative, it must document that obviously in, in, in the supporting documentation to its expected credit loss calculations. Thank you John. One of the questions I'm most often asked in practice is how many scenarios does a bank need? Can it have just a single kind of best estimate case scenario? Or does it need to consider, say, a best estimate with one or more upsides and one or more downsides? Well, there's no one right answer to that question. The standard doesn't specify a, a defined number of scenarios. However, it does give some guidance and the ITG also reiterated that guidance. Mm -hmm. One of the key things to consider is what's called non-linearities. What do I mean by non-linearity? Well, I mean that as a macroeconomic variable, say unemployment, changes, the effect on credit losses may not be proportionate. So if unemployment doubles, your expected credit losses may triple or quadruple. That's a non-linearity. And that's one of the key things to do, is to look at the book, to understand where the non-linearities are, and make sure those are captured in the scenarios you choose. Another consideration is that whilst you can't exclude information just because it's low probability, there may be some extreme scenarios where the impact is just not going to be material, and those could be ignored. The standard does require an unbiased estimate, so you do need to look across the whole range of scenarios and make sure you are including everything that's relevant. And finally, you need to bear in mind that what's relevant in one period may change in the next period. So the nonlinearities may change, economic conditions may change, so you can't set a number of scenarios and what those scenarios are and never revisit it. In practice, I think most banks are thinking of at least three scenarios, perhaps more, although there could be instances where that might not apply. John. The next question is, how do you take into account forward-looking information? And I suppose there's two ways of doing it. One, you can push the forward-looking information into your credit models. In other words, include the forward-looking information in your probabilities of default. Or two, you may seek to deal with forward-looking information or certain aspects of forward-looking information by way of a management overlay. And institutions are looking at, at uh, approaching this in, in different ways. I think it's fair to say that most institutions are trying to push as much 
stage forward looking information down into probabilities of default as they can. However, there are certain pieces of forward looking information that's very difficult to apply in an individual model. And there, in those circumstances, management may seek to deal with that forward looking information by way of a management overlay. I think there's two points I, I'd make here. The first is you need to be consistent in your approach to forward looking information when you're measuring expected credit loss and when you're considering whether there's, there's been a significant increase in credit risk. And secondly, if you're using a management overlay, you need to ensure that you don't double count, that you haven't included information in your model and then also included it by way of a management overlay. And the last point I'd say here, no matter what approach you, you take, even if it's a model or if it's overlay, there's a significant amount of management judgment that needs to be brought to bear when you're taking, when you're considering including forward-looking information in your ECL calculation, particularly on transition, because there's just not a lot of data uh, available to institutions as to how to correlate forward-looking information with probabilities of default. Okay. Thank you very much, John. So just to recap. Banks do need to include forward-looking information under IFRS 9. That is a major change from IFRS 39. As I think John's illustrated, it's not going to be easy. Banks don't have the data and models necessary to do it. There are various ways you can do it. The number of scenarios you need to incorporate may vary from one bank to another and indeed from one book to another. And the way you then push those scenarios down into the ECL measurement may also vary. But you do need to do it and this is going to be a big area of judgment and require quite some work. That's all for today. I hope you'll join us next time when we're going to talk a bit more about measuring ECL. If you'd like to subscribe for the whole series, then please do just click on the subscribe button on your screen. Bye-bye.